Ever wonder what psychologists talk about over coffee? I'm Debbie Sorensen, a clinical psychologist in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, where I specialize in rehab and health psychology and acceptance and commitment therapy. And I'm Diana Hill, a clinical psychologist in CSI in Santa Barbara, California, where I specialize in mindfulness and values-based approaches to therapy. In this podcast, we bring psychology research into practice by discussing topics from psychology with experts in the field and with each other. You'll get a glimpse into the books we read, the research we think is interesting, and the ideas from psychology that we use to thrive in our own lives. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Diana. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. I'm excited about the episode that you're bringing us today. Yes. So I have um, worked some um, with a psychologist named Dr. Adrian Sloan, who really specializes in her clinical work in the treatment of chronic pain. And so today I have a, an interview I did with Dr. Sloan about the psychological aspects of chronic pain. Why is psychology even involved in chronic pain? And then she's going to draw from her work using cognitive behavioral therapy approaches to chronic pain and talk about some of the key concepts from CBT that are she finds helpful in her clinical work to help people, you know, live their best life with chronic pain. Great. Well, I really look forward to listening. I think it's going to be helpful to a number of people that are out there suffering. Yeah, those who are suffering with, from chronic pain, or if you're working with folks with chronic pain in any in any way, I think you'll find this useful. Great, thanks, Debbie. Thank you. Dr. Adrian Sloan grew up in Denver and loves the multitude of activities Colorado allows for. She earned her doctorate from Texas Tech University and has focused much of her training in health psychology working mainly with chronic illnesses. She spent a number of years working with individuals with cancer and now works with veterans with chronic pain, ALS, as well as in primary care. Hi, Adrian. Hey, Debbie. It's really good to have you here. We've we've talked about doing this for a while, so I really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. I got to say, I was really excited when you asked if I would come on and talk about a topic and especially the one that we're going to be talking about today because I listen to the podcast too Aww. and I gotta say this is yeah you guys have a really good podcast it's it's a legitimate podcast well um, thank you so, thank you yeah so yeah. I, I'm very honored to be coming on as a guest speaker so thank you oh thank you we're honored to have you and I appreciate you've been so supportive of of me doing this and I really appreciate that you've you've listened and supported me in this venture. So, um, yeah, so yeah. Adrian is going to be, we're going to be having a conversation today about chronic pain. And, um, I think sometimes people are a little surprised to find out that psychology and psychologists are so involved with chronic in the chronic pain world. Um, so I'm really excited to hear some of your expertise today on chronic pain. So let's, let's get started. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a good point. Um, It's funny, once you get immersed in it, you kind of forget that it isn't common knowledge that psychology is a big piece of chronic pain. So yeah, so I'm excited to talk a little bit more about that. I think a good place to start would to just be to even just describe what is pain. And um, if you actually look up the the definition um, through the International Association for the Study of Pain, they define it as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in such terms of damage. Mm-hmm. So um, they, you know, pain is really, it's, it, I think, even for a while, I think part of why we're in this opiate crisis right now is that um, pain is really this subjective experience. And you can ask patients to give you a number, you know, one to 10, how bad is your pain? But we can't feel another person's actual experience of what that pain is. So, you know, for a while there, it was, you know, pain is a, the fifth vital sign. We're under treating it. Um, and now we've kind of switched um, into a different way of thinking about chronic pain. But there is this emotional component to it. Um, You know, we learn over time about what, what pain is through our early experiences. You know, you, if you have, we have different reactions from the people around us. Um, 
I think even gender differences, you know, a, a little boy falls on and stubs his toe and it's like, come on, you're a big boy. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't, you don't need to cry or like, no, that's just a little boo-boo, no big deal. Or, you know, maybe um, kind of from the opposite side, if a little girl falls and stubs her, her toe, it's, there's, there's a different, there tends to be a different reaction to that. So, um, and then people in our lives growing up have different reactions and we observe those reactions to pain or when people are sick and we, we observe all of this stuff um, forms our overall experience. Um, when it comes to the the idea of pain and how we perceive it or relate to pain. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, it's like our, our whole learning history of all of our experience is plays a role in how we experience pain and then how we communicate that to other people in terms of, you know, trying to get that subjective sense of it across to communicate it. Um, right. Yeah, already obvious that it's not such a simple like medical problem only where you can like look at an x-ray and be like, Oh, there's your pain, you know, where it's, um, it's just a lot more complicated than that. Yeah. And some people, it it may be in a ton of pain, but physically or outwardly, they're not expressing that in nonverbal ways. Um, And then you get someone on the other end of the spectrum who almost seems like they're, they might be exaggerating or it feels like they're exaggerating or that that's the perception that it like comes off as they're exaggerating their pain. And so it's, it can be really difficult to determine, like we just don't have no um, objective way really of measuring like how bad someone's pain is. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways we do have to just take them at their word for it, but um, we'll get into some of the, you know, how do we work with chronic pain or how do we treat it that um, talks a little bit about, you know, some of those outward expressions or those what we call pain behaviors. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I, I think that the, the key thing to remember is for the person, it's always this unpleasant experience. And so there's always going to be this emotional component. Mm-hmm. You know, and I guess another way to think about chronic pain, too, some, with, with acute pain, you know, you fall, like you were saying before, you fall and you, you break your leg or something. You're, you can actually see that break on x-rays. And the body is going to send us messages in those moments. Like, hey, don't stand up and walk on that leg. Mm-hmm. Because it's <laughs> cause more damage. Right. <laughs> so those are, you know, those are some acute, um, what we would call acute pain. You're going to get these these signals from your body that the alert, alarm here, there's something wrong. Like, don't, don't walk on your leg. But chronic pain is not that way. It's not this simple linear cause and effect relationship where you have tissue damage that equals pain or nerve stimulation that equals pain. That doesn't, that seldom explains the full pain experience, especially when we're talking about chronic pain. So just being able to see tissue damage or stimulating a nerve or whatever, that alone doesn't explain that whole chronic pain experience. So chronic pain is more if you if if it's kind of thought of as you know tissue or nerve damage has appears to be healed, but yet your body is still sending this signal that there's something wrong. So yeah, so if if you if you try to look at um, chronic pain from from a biological or medical perspective, it everything looks like it's fine or looks healed, and yet the person is still getting these messages that it's not. And, well, and um, that that alone, I think, is an important concept for people with chronic pain, because sometimes they worry that chronic pain is a signal that their body is getting like damaged in some way, which right. I suppose may rarely be the case, but often that's not the case, actually. So people might be doing things to compensate for that out of fear that they're going to make things worse when, in fact, often that's not true, right? Yes. It's, it's funny that you that you say that because... Um, even just yesterday, the rehab physician that I work with, he was kind of in this training moment. We, we had a room full of trainees, and um, we we're talking about, you know, how do you help a patient understand that, like, how chronic pain is this? It's, it's sending the wrong signals because it, it's, it's almost counterintuitive or, like, um, you're going against your instincts when you are feeling this level of pain. We've been raised and our experiences have taught us that, like, Hey, when something hurts, you pay attention to that. You know, mm-hmm. don't move, don't don't try to cause more damage. And um, 
And so he was, he was, he was going into this description of how he was working with one patient who had pain in their shoulder. And the pain, the patient said, it feels like there's someone is stabbing me with a knife and twisting the knife. And he's like, okay. And so kind of moving the, the patient's shoulder a little bit. Do you feel it now? Do you feel it now? And the patient's like, yes, right there. And he's like, okay, so you do know there's not a knife <laughs> in your shoulder, right? Uh-huh. And, and it's, it's kind of, you know, bringing that patient down a little bit. Uh, okay, so when I move your shoulder, nothing is wrong with me moving your shoulder, but you're getting these, what, what is wrong is you're getting the wrong messages. Your body is lighting up all of these nerves and these signals are being sent to you that there is a knife there, but you can see there is no knife. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so that can sometimes be a helpful way of, you know, for him, how he goes about explaining to a patient that, like, your body is getting these signals that are kind of faulty in some way. And our, our reaction, which is totally normal, is to, not, like, not move it or, you know, not cause more damage. But there's, we we almost have to learn how to ignore those signals or move past them in a different way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about how when we, when we treat chronic pain, like what are some things that can be helpful in terms of those thought processes? But I think something that is, there was this study done during World War II. It was this guy Beecher, where he observed this battle that had happened in, at Anzio Beachhead um, over in Europe. And what he was really surprised by was these soldiers were coming in from the battlefield with these serious injuries. And they didn't seem to be bothered. Um, they didn't seem to feel a mm-hmm. whole lot. They weren't expressing a whole lot of pain. They weren't requesting morphine. And um, he thought it was odd because when you compare those, those experiences to people in the hospital who are coming in with very similar injuries, you know, that people in the hospital mm-hmm. would be reporting higher levels of pain, a lot more pain, requesting morphine, requesting more and more, more, more and more morphine. And he thought, you know, this is really interesting. What could be playing a role here? We've got people that are, you know, coming with blast injuries and gunshot wounds, and they're not, they're not complaining of pain. And when you, when he went back and asked these soldiers um, what their experience was like, you know, there's the the thoughts that these soldiers were having, the um, perceptions around their injuries were very different. There, these injuries were a sign of, you know, freedom, and um, I'm going to be a war hero, and this injury is my ticket home. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. these thoughts that the, I mean, that the, the the idea that came from or like the, the outcome of this study was that Beecher had, the conclusions that Beecher had come to was, well, wow, the thoughts that you have around your pain experience really shape or affect how you experience that pain. So when your experience of this injury is, wow, this is, I'm an, I'm a war hero and this is my ticket home. You know, I don't have to stay fighting in this war. It's not as painful of an experience as, you know, you're in the hospital and you're coming in and it, gosh, this is a horrific um, injury that I have. So it, that was, I think that was a really monumental study in, in highlighting how our perceptions or the thoughts that we have around our pain can affect how we experience our pain. Yeah, like the positive sort of spin on that, the way that people had sort of the context of it being a good thing in their life made it so that the pain itself was less, you know, unpleasant or they just didn't even feel it as much. Yeah, exactly. And so that really ties into more of how pain can be this emotional experience. And how tapping into when we're when we're looking at how do we help people manage chronic pain, we do want to look at how are people thinking about you know what are the thoughts that they have around their pain experience or in and you know just different moments of the day, and how you know how is that impacting their emotional experience of the pain as well. Um, but something that I think is important also to highlight is that we do see some some patterns with patients who are dealing with chronic pain in terms of um, mental health diagnoses or other mental health experiences um, or symptoms. And I'm going to veer off a little bit into this 
study on something we were talking about a little bit before um, was the ACE scores and and um, how ACE stands for adverse childhood experiences. Oh yeah, yeah, it was so interesting. You were telling me about that the other day. Yeah, and so so I'm going to veer off a little bit into um, the the childhood experiences world for, but I'll tie it in. So there's this woman Nadine Burke Harris. And for those of you listening who really like um, hearing about other podcasts or um, other studies, she's a, she, she did a TED Talk, um, and they recently on the TED podcast um, presented her in one of their episodes on this topic of the, ACE, the adverse childhood experiences. Um, but her TED Talk really informs a lot of what I do with patients in that she is she's a pediatrician in the San Francisco area and she opened this clinic in an area of town that has like lower socioeconomic status people that are you know struggling to kind of make it through their everyday life and because they want to bring mm-hmm. good medical help to um, an area where there traditionally wasn't so she um, talks about in her podcast or her TED talk, she talks about noticing how she was treating a lot of these asthma exacerbations, rashes, attention deficits. And one day she decided to ask one of her patient's mom, um, do you notice anything that triggers your daughter's asthma um, exacerbations? And this mom said, well, yeah, when my husband punches his hand through the wall or his fist through the wall, she seems have an exacerbation (laughs) of asthma. Yeah. So she, this really kind of lit up a lot of, you know, she was like, wow, this, I wonder how much of this is actually these adverse experiences um, or kind of traumatic experiences that my kids are, my children, my patients are experiencing that is affecting these health outcomes or like what I'm seeing in my clinic. And maybe we're approaching treating these kids in the wrong way and maybe we need to pay more attention to what's going on at home and it was shortly after or around this time that one of her colleagues brought in a study which was the ACE scores the ACE this uh, adverse childhood experiences study and so what this study looked at was it was it was done by the combination of the CDC and Kaiser a doctor at Kaiser and they looked at I think over 17,000 patients where they asked the patient to, um, there's like a checklist of what they call adverse childhood experiences. And this, these are things from like divorce to, you know, an, growing up with an alcoholic parent or a parent with a mental health diagnosis or something as severe as sexual trauma or abuse, neglect, all of these um, potential experiences that you could have had as a child growing up. They asked all of these people in their study to basically check off how many of these things have you experienced in life. And what they found Mm -hmm. was that there was this dose response outcome for how, how, however, however many experiences you had had as a child or the higher your ACE score was, the more likely you were to have these bad health outcomes. So I think it was, you know, like two, to, now I'm, now I can't remember the exact numbers, but like two to four times the rate of, of like COPD exacerbation, developing COPD or um, hmm. of ischemic heart disease, which is like the number one killer in America. And her talk was really interesting. And she said, you know, okay, well, maybe this, this isn't science. I mean, this is just, you you have a bad childhood, so yeah, you're more likely to do things like drink and smoke and have a bad health because of that. But she said this is, it turns out this is exactly where the science comes in, in that even if you don't engage in bad health behaviors, you are still like 12 times more likely to um, commit suicide or like, seven times before, I don't remember the exact numbers, but you were still more likely to have, to develop cancer or um, this Mm -hmm. ischemic heart disease. And so what I found very fascinating about that, and she went into this as well, is that why is this, you know, what is happening 
in particular, as we're children during this time of development, that is like, why is it so, it's almost more important as children, if we're experiencing these adverse experiences, your little body is developing at this time. And we, I mean, we know the research mm-hmm. is out there to show that there are real brain changes. When, when a child goes through severe neglect or abuse, their brains do develop differently. We can see that on imaging. But wasn't, mm-hmm. what isn't as clear is what effects that those experiences have on the developing nervous system and the developing immune system. And Nadine Burke Harris talks about how, gosh, you know, we have this, amazing fight or flight response system that we've developed over time to help us escape like a bear or a mountain lion. And, you know, this is a very adaptive system that helped us to, to either fight that bear or run from it. And she says um, almost comedically, she's like, and that's a wonderful thing if there's a bear, <laughs> Right. (laughs) Yes, we want that system to to activate and get us the heck out of Dodge or to to fight if we need to. But the problem is when that bear is coming home every night and your little immune system that's in the process of developing is pumping out adrenaline and cortisol every night, this goes from this, um, you know, adaptive life-saving experience or system to a maladaptive and health damaging system. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, to me, this was so, such an important talk or such an important study to pay attention to, because when we're, when I'm working with patients who as adults are dealing with chronic pain and, and, you know, I don't know what the number, the exact numbers are, but I will tell you in my own personal experience, I have only had one or two patients who have not had a history of childhood abuse, neglect, sexual trauma. And hmm. yeah. I, and there, it's astonishing um, how, how many people who um, are dealing with chronic pain, at least that I have worked with, who have had, you know, their ACE scores would be pretty high. And I, I, yeah. I believe that there is, when you are going, when your body is developing under, um, you know, abusive or traumatic experiences, your, your body doesn't develop in the same way. And, yeah. and the yeah. nervous system is operating differently than somebody who hasn't had those experiences. And so knowing that pain is this signal that's sent through the nervous system, <laughs> I think that's a really relevant point to, you know, to point out or to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this kind of speaks to that, you know, you hear this term thrown around all the time of the mind-body connection, you know, you hear that Mm -hmm. around. But if you think about like, what does that really mean? I think that both of these examples, the World War II study with pain perception, and this one about sort of childhood adversity and trauma and how that affects your body, like down the road and your nervous system, just speaks to how complex that is and how that really there is such a connection. It's almost if you think about it, it almost doesn't really make sense to even there. I mean, obviously, there are two different things, but like how connected the mind and the body are yes. that that even making that separation between mind and body is almost a little artificial because they're so intertwined with each other. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes a lot of sense that something like pain that 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 kind of emotional component and your history that all is playing in a role, a role in how your your body is responding to pain. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of times patients will come in um, and they're upset by, you know, I've been, they've been given the message that this is all in their head. And in some ways, I mean, as right. in a literal sense, yes, you're pro- we all process pain. Our brain is where those signals are, are re- re- receiving and sending out signals from our brain and through our nervous system. So in some ways, literally, yes, it is. <laughs> it is in your brain. Um, right. But, but like I'll often say to patients, especially those that, that we, we have talked about, you know, this trauma history is, um, you know, our body knows, our body has a knowing that like we, we may not, it might not be housed in the language center of our brain where we can explain it verbally, you know, or explain it somehow to other people, but our body has a knowing and trauma 
Yeah. Trauma sits in the body. Yeah. And it's, it's not, you know, when you often see this kind of classic presentation of somebody who's been sexually traumatized, there's, there's, they oftentimes have, um, like hip, pelvic, um, and low back pain. And, um, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I think that the body holds on to, onto these, these traumatic experiences and, it can be so confusing because it feels like, no, there's something wrong here. And again, going back to mm-hmm. that, well, we're not seeing something medically that we can, ex- that can explain this. So how else do we go about trying to manage this pain? Yeah. So, um, well, and I think that the, the education piece is so key there because if the medical provider, so obviously the other you know, there's psychology on these kind of teams, but there's also a lot of medical, um, you know, perspectives as well on chronic pain, but that sometimes they give the, the message of like, oh, it's just in your head in the sense of like, we don't believe you or this isn't real, but that's not the case either. And I think that can come across as really invalidating to people, but your, your subjective experience or your perception of pain is valid but and yet what i think what you're what we're saying here is that there's also this component where yeah it is coming through our brain and our nervous system and our whole experience yeah um plays a role yeah yeah and i think it's interesting yeah and i i often think that like um you know when you're working with somebody with chronic pain it almost you almost work against yourself if that's the message that's being sent as a provider it's almost right. like, it's, it, I mean, I, I think you just have to kind of operate from the stance of like, we believe that you, that you really are feeling this, even if we can't explain it in like a Absolutely. medical sense, you know, we really do believe it. Right, so right. How do we then still move forward? And you're right. There, there is a huge right. component here that like your nervous system is sending a lot of signals that like, that are telling you that you're in pain, even though we can't necessarily see that. Um, and Right. That can be really helpful when um, working with patients to explain it that way, that it's these, it's like a misfire. Right. So, yeah, just because it doesn't, it's not something that shows up on the x-ray, like we were saying before, doesn't mean that that's not really your experience and that you're not really having pain. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think something that would be helpful, too, to go into a little bit is that, um, like, tying back into that emotional experience of pain and like how we think about our pain and how that that plays a role in you know, chronic pain you know, depression and other type of other types of psychological symptoms really do influence the pain experience and also how we're coping partly through that that cognitive or emotional and behavioral perspective so we talked about like you and I have talked about like the biopsychosocial model and um how when we're working with patients, we want to, we want to be incorporating these, looking at things from different perspectives and, and trying to incorporate all of those different perspectives. So we're not just treating from a biological standpoint, you know, from a medical standpoint, but there's also these psychological Mm -hmm. components as well as social components. You know, what is the support system that this patient has or what other messages is this patient getting from the their spouse or their children, you know, who might, who might be at home with them around their pain experience. Um, and what's really interesting is to look at um, how pain and mood, to look at that a little bit more pain and mood and what are some of the, um, what are some of the numbers out there? Like how, how common is depression, anxiety, and other types of psychological distress? How common is that in, in, in the experience of chronic pain? And we actually see a lot of overlap. So, um, a lot of times patients will say, well, gosh, my pain is really making me depressed. But we, we often see that depression and anxiety also make pain worse. So it has this kind of reciprocal right. relationship, mood and pain. That, mm-hmm. um, and, and I think that's an important concept for pa- that patients, um, when you're working with chronic pain, that, that, that really needs to be understood. Um, that it's not just your pain that's making you depressed. Cause a lot of times that's, that's like what patients will come in saying, like, well, I wouldn't be depressed if I didn't have pain, but you know what? Your depression is actually affecting your pain as well. Yeah. And that, and yeah. That, that, I think in my, ex- 
in my experience, a lot of the, the patients I've talked to about this will say, yes, like I've noticed when I'm more depressed or when I'm more stressed out or whatever, I do notice that my pain is worse. Yeah. So I think their experience sort of tells them that too. Yeah. That it, the relationship goes both ways. Yes. Yes. And, and I think that's, I do think that's an important connection that the patient needs to make, to make, um, is that, that 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 loops back mood loops back and affects pain Mm -hmm. just as much as pain is going to affect your mood um and and getting back to that mind body connection right we can't separate those things um they are so Mm -hmm. tightly intertwined okay so there was this study done looking at um kind of this relationship between mood and chronic pain and um how common is it to see psychiatric illnesses or other types of symptoms um, in the chronic pain population? The study looked at 200 patients suffering with low back pain. The study was done by Politan, Kinney, Gatchel, Lilo, or Lilo, and Mayer in 1993. And the title of the article was Psychiatric Illness and Chronic Low Back Pain, The Mind and the Spine, Which Goes First? And Mm -hmm. what they did was they looked at they looked at how many how many of these patients met criteria for um, like depression, anxiety, or personality disorder or substance use disorder. And what they found was that 77% of these patients met um, lifetime diagnostic criteria for at least one psychiatric disorder. 77%. Um, 59. Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, 59% had current symptoms for at least one psychiatric diagnosis. And then 51% met criteria for a personality disorder. And they were able to try to parse out, did this, did the emotional experience happen before your pain or did the pain, you know, what, where in the timeline of your experience of chronic pain, did these more um, depression, anxiety, other types of emotional symptoms, like where in the timeline did they come along? And what they found was that 54% of the patients um, in this study had had depression before developing their chronic pain. 94% mm-hmm. had a substance abuse or met criteria for substance abuse prior to experiencing chronic pain. And 95% had um, anxiety prior to their pain problem. Huh. Yeah. So, so I think that again, pointing out how this mind body connection, how mood is a really important part of managing pain Mm -hmm. in this experience of chronic pain in particular, that it's really important to look at how is somebody's mood, what, what's going on in their emotional life life that we could be um, looking at. It's it's essential, I think, to do that. And I think that is why typically when you look at an interdisciplinary pain team, like the one you work on, you know, that there's psychology plays a key role because it that's just something that needs to be um, evaluated and treated in it along with the pain if, if there is a, you know, depression or anxiety or substance use going on as well. Yeah, absolutely. So what do we do with this? You know, how do we, when we're working with patients, how do we how do we help them knowing all of this stuff about that mind body connection and, and mood and how how important mood is in in the role of chronic pain and how do we work with patients so on the team that i work on we we tend to take more of this cognitive behavioral stance but there are a lot of different treatments out there that you can use um so i know you do a lot of work with act and uh, mm-hmm. i'm sure you can probably speak to some of that as, as well here. Um, and, and I actually, in the groups that I run or when I'm working with an individual, I, I, the framework is, is cognitive behavioral, but I do incorporate a lot of mindfulness techniques Mm -hmm. and some act exercises as well. So like when I'm trying to work with somebody, for example, around how do you let go of having to control this? So a lot of times patients will come to us and, at least initially, the idea is take away my pain, fix it. I don't want it. Um, it's, it's a horrible experience. I want to get rid of it. 
and you'll, you know, when we work with them around what are your goals being on our team, um, what type, types of things is pain interfering with, patients often have this mindset of like, well, can't you just give me a medication or an, or an injection or is there some procedure that you can do that will just take away my pain? And a lot of times mm-hmm. our goal, we, we say with patients or say to patients, you know, our goal is actually not to take away your pain because we don't believe we can do that. If we could, we would, but that's, that's not our goal. Our goal is to get you, how do you still engage in life despite the pain? Mm-hmm. And what's really interesting yeah. is, um, you know, as a little side note here, What's really interesting is patients are oftentimes come onto our team on high doses of opioids, and one of the one of the goals is to to decrease that or to get them completely off. And we get a lot of pushback initially because um, they are very dependence inducing or addictive substances. But patients don't believe us that their pain is either not going to change or, in fact, get better. <laughs> and yeah. And we, we, we regularly see that when patients are, it's a rough, bumpy first few rows. That's that there's no denying that. Yeah. But when patients are a few weeks out and even I, we've had patients that have, we've, we've been able to meet with like a year or two later, oftentimes what they tell us is, oh my gosh, my pain is so much better. Or, um, yeah, I, my pain level is about the same, but I'm so much happier. You know, I'm back yeah. The relationship with my wife is improved or um, I'm, I'm, I'm now going to my kids' baseball games and um, or I'm, I'm, I'm back engaging in choir. And we have one patient that was like went back to singing that they hadn't done in a long time. And so it's interesting that. Yeah, I love that. It's like people people go from so focused on like the pain and I've got to get rid of it, almost like tunnel vision. And then they like open their viewpoint to other things that matter to them in their life that they may have been neglecting. Yeah. And and if they can make it through that rough patch of getting off the medication, because that's, that's hard. Yes. You know, it's not very pleasant in the beginning, yes. but that that can also like really help. Yeah. It's, 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 and, it, and yeah. it takes a while to, you, they have to almost go through it to really be convinced and not everybody, we can't get everybody there because a lot of times the, there's, there's other things that come up that they just, you know, they're not ready for it. But when, when patients yeah. can get through that rough patch, it's, it's really cool to see um, how their lives really do improve. Yeah. So I will oftentimes in the first session with a patient or with a group, I will do this exercise of letting go. It's an ACT exercise, an acceptance and commitment therapy exercise of um, the digging. Uh, have you ever done that one where you? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have them picture themselves in this open field, and this open field represents life, the experience of life. And um, the funny thing about this field is that there's a bunch of holes out there and each hole is a representation of like a trauma or you know a negative experience and one of those holes is chronic pain um but the thing is is that you're blindfolded so you don't know where these holes are and um you're given a bag of what you think is a bag of tools but when you eventually are walking out in this field of life and fall into the chronic pain hole, you, you open your bag because that's what you were told to do, open your bag, and all that's in there is a shovel. And so you do what you're supposed to do with a shovel. You start digging. And it's like, okay, well, this is what I'm told to do, so I must do this. But we all know that, like, when you're in a hole, digging doesn't get you out. It just makes the hole bigger. Mm-hmm. But – Oftentimes mm-hmm. the the feeling is like, well, this is what I was told to do. I, I must, I must. There must be something about this. I'm going to just keep digging. And and so um, the the idea is, can we just acknowledge that in a lot of ways our medical system is like this? You know, the medical system in in this country tells us take a pill. There's a procedure. There's another diagnosis that must explain this. And all of those are different ways of digging. And if mm-hmm. we can just acknowledge that that's what we've been doing and maybe we just need to stop digging, that it's, it's making this worse, like in, it's, in essence, letting go of trying to control this pain experience, that can be a really helpful emotional place to be in of I'm going to stop yeah. to, to dig here and, and frantically search or try to control this pain. And so <laughs> trying to control the pain, how can I control my life? 
when you do this work, sometimes you encounter, um, you know, clients who have been digging for years, yeah. like decades sometimes, where they've been trying through these things that make perfect sense to try to yeah. deal with their pain, but they have just put their life on hold because they're, you know, digging and digging and digging by trying this and trying that and looking at this and that and doing all these interventions and whatever and things that are perfectly reasonable to do. But in the meantime, their life has been hold on hold for so many years right. that they've really missed out on a lot of important things. Right. Um, so this can be a pretty big shift for people. Yes. And there, we oftentimes get a lot of resistance initially to that. Um, but when we are moving through the treatment process, I think that's kind of where we, where I start with patients is how do we, how do we begin this process of letting go of trying to control the pain and instead letting pain be there, but also being present in our lives. So that's where yeah. it's not necessarily traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, but that's where I will sometimes incorporate some of these other techniques like mindfulness or acceptance and commitment therapy, you know, when I'm getting started. Yeah, patients. I think, th yeah, I think the CBT approach, the cognitive behavioral therapy, the sort of traditional one has years and years of evidence. Yeah. Um, and then the more mindfulness based ones like acceptance and commitment therapy can also have something to offer too, just in terms of the framework shift that you're talking about. Yeah. So yeah, it's interesting. So yeah. So what are some of the key components that you you've worked with in terms of cognitive behavioral therapy? So yeah, that you find most helpful. Yeah, I think um, you know. So oftentimes I'll kind of start with that little exercise, but we 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 go into it. There's this educational component where um, we we talk to patients about the gate control theory to pain, and then the cycle of disability that patients can get stuck in, and um, so the gate control theory is, is tries to incorporate that, that whole idea of the mind-body connection and that our pain experience is processed through the nervous system or the spinal cord. And um, there are the ideas that there are all these gates and channels that line the spinal cord that open or close. And when they're open, pain signals or pain messages are allowed to flow much more rapidly or readily. Um, when they're closed, pain messages aren't as easily sent. And so the idea is how do mm -hmm. we teach, so we're, you know, what oftentimes what I'll say is, so what we're going to do over the next few weeks is teach you different skills that in different ways try to help close those gates and channels. Now, there's a lot of things that can cause those gates and channels to open or close. Um, so medications, for example, is like kind of the easiest one for patients to understand. Like medications are one way that we can at times close those gates or channels. Or like a TENS unit, you know, what that sends electrical messages through the body or through the nervous system. It, it's like that's um, oftentimes patients will say when I'm wearing my TENS, I, it does help with the pain because it's interfering with the pain signals by sending these electrical mm -hmm. messages. Uh, physical therapy, you know, learning, learning different exercises through physical therapy can help with opening or closing those gates or channels. But there are, I mean, there's physical ways, there's, there's cognitive ways, emotional ways, um, activity, um, you know, overdoing it or underdoing it, you know, just sitting on the couch all day mm -hmm. is just as detrimental to overdoing it physically. Um, and, and then even socially, um, what, you know, what kind of support are we getting from our family and friends? And sometimes, um, you know, if we're not getting enough support from our family and friends, then that can be one way that the gates open or, you know, can be detrimental. But if we're being enabled or getting almost too much support, from our family and friends. Um, those are all, mm -hmm. so there, there are so many different ways that we can open and close those gates. But I will refer back to this theory, the gate control theory, throughout the, the weeks. Okay, well, you know, patient will come mm -hmm. in and say this, this, such and such happened to me. And I'm like, okay, do you think that opened or closed the gates? <laughs> and, um, oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. That, that, like, that can oftentimes be a way of you know, that it's an easy um, theory for patients to understand and a very simplistic theory to chronic pain, but certainly one that's helpful. 
yeah, they can like tie it to what's going on in their life, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that, that educational piece, the gate control theory to pain, but there's also the cycle of disability that we'll review as well. And that again is a, a, a very simple way of thinking about how pain inter- interferes with our lives and, you know, a very, um, normal response to pain is to to not do anything to sit be sedentary don't go out and socialize um you know the, there's oftentimes the fear of like well i'm afraid to go out and go to this holiday party with my friends or my family or work or whatever because i'm afraid of how i'm going to feel after and so instead of going i'm just going to sit at home on the couch what happens when we're sitting mm-hmm. at home and isolating, not only physically is there going to be a deterioration, um, especially if this is a chronic thing that you're doing. There's muscle wasting, there's tightness, weight gain, um, all of which negatively loop back and affect pain, make it worse. But there's also this emotional component. You're sitting at home and isolating. All you're doing is thinking about your pain and feeling bad about yourself, right. you know, I mean, you're emotionally, yeah. depression and anxiety start to um, escalate when, when we're not engaging in life. And that, as we've talked about, loops back and affects our pain, makes our pain worse. Well, when our pain is worse, mm-hmm. here we go again, you know, then, then it affects yep. our mood. It makes, you know, so we get, we can get caught and stuck in this cycle of what we call the cycle of disability, where our mood is making pain worse or other things that we're doing physically or not doing physically makes pain worse, which then loops back and makes all those other things worse. So, Mm -hmm. and patients really respond to that. They're like, oh yeah, that is exactly what's happened. And they'll tell you all these stories of ways that their life has, has spiraled down into this negative feedback loop. Yeah. So trying to shake that up and Bring some new new behavior patterns yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, and and that's oftentimes yeah. what we'll say is how do we cut how do we cut that cycle off and start a different feedback system for us? You know, how do we start a, a different mm-hmm. or a different pattern? I, I would say there's four main components to the CBT model, the cognitive behavioral therapy model. Um, it, it starts with that educational component, but um, I would say the four, after the educational piece, the four main components are breathing retraining. And you know, we talked earlier about those ACE scores and the effect on the nervous system and you know, pain is processed through the nervous system. And so tapping into the nervous system is very important when we're trying to retrain the body, um, how to have a different experience with pain. And oftentimes with, with pain, the body's natural response is to kind of tighten up to activate. And we don't even realize that this is happening, but you experience the pain. It's like, you know, you can like feel your body tensing in different areas. And a lot of times um, our body tenses in areas that we're not even aware of. That, again, loops back and makes our pain worse. And, I, you know, it's really interesting. I've had a number of patients when they start to really focus on their body and what's going on in their body in reaction to pain, they have, I had one patient that was like, oh my God, I had no idea I tensed my jaw. I was clenching my teeth. Um, I had another Right. They're like, I didn't even notice how much my eyes, <laughs> I squinched my eyes and my forehead and like all these facial muscles. I didn't, had no idea. And so when they would do um, some of these techniques, they would really focus on some of those parts of their body that they didn't even, you know, they were just now starting to learn that they were tensing and they had no idea that they were doing this before. But so breathing is, breathing retraining is such a simple thing. And I think Part of why it doesn't get more attention is because it's free. <laughs> you know, you don't have to pay to learn. <laughs> you don't have to pay to learn how to breathe. It seems so simple, but I mean, it's cute. Yeah. When we're breathing in, <laughs> when I'll I'll describe it in a little bit more detail here. But like when we're breathing in a particular way, it we we tap into that nervous system from the calming side, mm-hmm. and and the side that lets us relax. So what is this breathing technique? It's it's diaphragmatic breathing. And what's really fun to do with my with patients is to have them put their hands 
um, either hold them normally at their sides or on their um, chest and belly and just kind of see what hand is moving more, just breathing naturally. I'm doing it right now. Yeah. I'm doing it. You, what you want is you want the, the patient to really try to focus on moving the hand that's on their belly, make sure that that's the hand that's moving more. But sometimes what I'll do with patients is I'll say, okay, now let's put our hands up behind our head, you know, like that relaxation stance where oh, I'm going to lay back and relax. So our hands are up behind our head or neck. And now try to breathe and feel the difference. It, it kind of, when you put your hands up behind your head, it kind of forces your belly to breathe more than your chest. Yeah, it does. No, interesting. I've never tried that before. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. I had a student <laughs> in one of our groups that we were running who, who did that with our patients. And I was like, whoa, I'm so going to use that. So belly breath, but the other important key piece to this breathing technique is actually the exhale. So we talk about deep breathing, but it's it's not so much um, breathing deep because we're actually, we want to get rid of oxygen. Oxygen is very activating. And when we're taking in a lot of oxygen, um, it's, it's going to activate more of that fight or flight um, side of our nervous system. So when we're breathing out, exhaling, really, we're slow. If we slow that down and really try to make that last as long as we can, that's getting rid of oxygen. And that's actually activating the parasympathetic nervous system or that calming side of the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And so it's, so we, we talk about, yeah, it's important. We want to be make sure you're diaphragmatic breathing, breathing with your belly, but that you're also really focusing on that exhale and slowing that down and um, extending that piece as long as you can. And, you know, the other thing that was interesting that I, I, I recently learned, too, is when we breathe in this way, um, the diaphragm actually hits on that vagal nerve or the vagus nerve. And that also mm -hmm. is a can activate that that calming part of our nervous system. This yeah. is something I'll tell patients. Um, you know, practice this breathing technique five to eight times in the morning and five to eight times in the evening before bed. And, you know, you can use it as many times as you want throughout the day. I mean, even just taking one breath is can be enough of a reset. But the regular practice of that breathing technique has been shown to, to have real effects on our brain and on our body's response to pain. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's really important to emphasize with patients, you know, this breathing technique is not going to be effective just in an acute pain exacerbation. So you've got to regularly be practicing this, like on a daily basis, tapping into your nervous system in a regular, in a, in a consistent way. It's going to be much more effective at helping you calm and get through those pain exacerbations when you've been practicing it regularly. Yeah, I think that if you don't, if you sort of know this, but you don't actually use it and practice it, it doesn't do you much good. Exactly. So after the breathing retraining, the second component that I think is essential is the relaxation. So breathing is kind of a precursor to that, but we will teach patients, the ones that we, that we teach, teach patients is uh, progressive muscle relaxation and visual imagery, but there are so many relaxation exercises out there. It's kind of like whatever you know, patient can find that works well for them, stick with that. So there are so many apps, you know, a common one we use is calm.com, but there's stop breathing. Make calm. That's funny. Calm.com. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say. I have to slow myself down when I say Yeah. <laughs> Um, but that's a real popular <laughs> one. And you know, it's funny. I actually use that, that with my kids, that, um, that app with my kids, like at bedtime, they've got these like bedtime stories and, um, those things really work. They are very calming and relaxing, but there's, there's all these different mindfulness or kind of guided meditations. There's a body scan meditation. There's, um, a meta, what are the, what is that the meta meditation? What's the other word for that? Like a loving kindness meditation. Uh, mm, and mm -hmm. there, there are a bunch of free ones, but there's also, if you pay, you can pay um, to get access to 
more of the uh, meditation, but anything really, it's like whatever you find works, whether it's progressive muscle relaxation or an app, or if they've got, you know, CDs, relaxation CDs, or if it's just simply listening to music, whatever it is that allows a patient to relax and they practice, they practice that and they like it. Like that's, that's it. Go with that. Stay with that. But the, I mean, again, just like the breathing component is so important because it taps into the calming part of our nervous system. It's the same reason we do these relaxation techniques because it taps in Mm -hmm. that nervous system component. And, and again, it's closing those gates and you know what patients love it. So so breathing, retraining, relaxation, and then we'll move into automatic thoughts and cognitive restructuring. And this tends to be the most challenging concept for patients to, to grasp, but it gets at what we were talking, earlier, talking about earlier with the soldiers. You know, the thoughts that they were having around their pain really affected the experience of their pain. And so we'll really get into... What are your what are your thoughts around your pain? Are you having thoughts like this is the worst experience ever? I hate this. I just want it to go away. My life is over. I can't believe I'm going to have to deal with. It. I mean, if those are the thoughts that you're having, mm-hmm. like, and that like there's there is an effect on our thoughts are connected to our emotional and behavioral experiences. And so if those are the thoughts you're having around your pain, your pain is going to be that much more unpleasant. So getting patients to to think about or to tap into, have more awareness of what are their thoughts around their pain, um, and how do we how do we really examine or challenge those thoughts? So is this really is my life really over because of this pain? Right. Well, no, I'm still alive, <laughs> and uh-huh. um, and I'm still you know there are still things that I can do. Um, in a pain exacerbation, a, a really helpful thought that we will help patients restructure is um, this is never going to end. Um, this is the worst experience. Ever. Mm-hmm. And instead, we'll wait. I've been through this before. The whole idea of a pain exacerbation is that it comes, but it also goes. <laughs> it doesn't It doesn't ever last right. forever. Right. So reminding yourself. This too shall pass. Yes. <laughs> Having these different types of thought is really important when we're trying to manage our pain differently. And, and I think the hardest part about automatic thoughts is really just having the awareness that, you're ha- that you have to yeah. these or these thoughts to begin with. That's the hardest part. Once patients begin with yeah, that, yeah. it's pretty easy to get into challenging those thoughts or restructuring them in a way that's much more effective. Um, so that's a, that's a, yeah, I think just helping them notice that their mind is doing this, that these are thoughts, that that's what they tend to think in these situations. That's, that's like something that can definitely take some work, but can be really helpful yeah. to have that awareness. Yeah. And, you know, and oftentimes, you know, in this, in this, um, when we're talking about this skill, I will also point out that, you know, we, we don't necessarily have to change our thoughts first before our behaviors or emotions follow. Although that is very important. Sometimes it's, it's, we got to change our behaviors first and then the thoughts will follow. Um, And that, that's really interesting too. When you can see, sometimes we'll say, all right, if you're having trouble um, with restructuring these thoughts or like thinking of things in a different way, let's, let's figure out what, what's the behavior first. What do we want to, how do you want to, um, how do you want to behaviorally change? What does that want? What do you want that to look like first? You know, engaging with your, your family, going out to dinner with family and friends or going to that yoga class. Let's do the behaviors first. And then it's, it, that can be a really powerful experience too. Sometimes the behavior change comes before our thoughts change. Um, right. Like you can bring those thoughts right along with you and still do the behavior and that once you do that, your overall quality of life is so much better. Yeah, And that might actually affect how you're thinking because your experience, you'll learn some different way of, you know, thinking about it from your experience that you're having. Yeah. Like, oh, it wasn't actually as bad as I, my mind was telling me it was going to yeah. be. Yeah. 
that's good to know. Yes, right? Yeah. But the key is really tuning into that, tuning into how powerful our thoughts can be. And oftentimes, I mean, our brains are constantly running. <laughs> they are constantly talking yep. to us. <laughs> And even for those of us that really are trying hard to be more aware of that, there's still so much that we don't, we're not tuned into. Um, so they are always running. And it's, it's important to, especially in, in trying to manage your pain differently or having a different experience with your pain, to be aware of what, what your brain is telling you and to be t- tuned into that a lot more. Mm-hmm. And then, so then the last, um, so we talked about breathing retraining, relaxation, automatic thoughts, and cognitive restructuring. And then I think another um, important component is activity pacing. Patients can completely relate to the idea of, wow, I physically overdid this. And, and, and so the skill that we teach is, is time-based pacing. So not pacing your activity based on your pain you know, like not getting to that point where you're in so much pain and then you stop, but, but paying attention to the time frame. So, and stopping at a point before your pain goes into that out of control range. So a common pattern is patients will overdo it physically because maybe they're feeling good on a particular day. And so they're like, okay, I've got this whole checklist of things that I need to get done now while I'm feeling good. So they'll paint the front room. They'll, They'll um, clean out the weeds in the garden. They'll, I had one guy that put a, <laughs> put a whole fence up. <laughs> Did you have to do the whole thing? Right, right. Couldn't you just depart? Yeah. I had a guy who was like lifting bag of, bags of cement. <laughs> yeah. You know, 50 pound. He felt so good. He's like, I'm just going to move all these bags <laughs> of cement. It's like, uh, yeah, that's... yeah. I mean, and it's funny. But... That's pretty extreme. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean it's we'll get a good laugh out of it. And, you know, this is where like humor could be such a good thing. Um, we'll laugh at it. Did you really think that that was the best idea? Right. Um, and, and it makes so much sense when you like sit and talk about it. Patients are like, yeah, like it does make sense. But in the moment, like I felt good and, yeah, you know, I wanted to get this done. And so patients will, they can really relate to that. But what happens is then they're out for like three days and then then that gets into that cycle of disability where all the negative thoughts start rushing in and then they feel sometimes they feel mm-hmm. guilty or they're they feel god why'd i do that you really beat themselves up and what do we know about the gate control theory like when we're when we're in that space that's opening all those gates and making our pain worse and so um, the, the example in the workbook is like, okay, you've got this room to paint and we all know how physically challenging painting a room can be. Um, and so if you know, and, and part of this takes some experience of like knowing where your pain threshold is, like what, like how much you can really, um, how long you can really go before your pain does kick in. Um, but sometimes it's, it's like a kind of trial and error um, you got to go through things first to know where that, where your stopping point is. But the idea is, okay, if you know that you can go for 15 minutes before your pain gets bad, stop at like 10, take yeah. a break, giving yourself regular breaks so that you are, you're fine the next day, you know, instead of being out for three days, right. you're managing it in a, in a, in a time based way so that you're, you're not putting yourself out. Now, yeah so yeah a good example of this is we had this woman that um doing the dishes every night after dinner was causing her to be in so much pain she would she after the dishes were done she'd go upstairs and go to bed and then she was missing out on all this family time um and felt really guilty about that and so we practiced this time-based approach with the dishes where you know, every few minutes she, and I forget, I think it was like five minutes or 10 minutes. Um, it wasn't that long. She would have, she would stop and Mm -hmm. take a break and she'd sit down with her kids and they'd watch TV or they'd, you know, maybe they'd be doing some homework at the table or something, but she'd take a break and then she'd go back, do some more dishes, take another break. Now it took her (laughs) all night to do the dishes. And that, that was a tough, that was a tough mental thing to get over for her. But she wasn't out the rest of the night and she wasn't in pain the next day yeah. and she was spending time with her kids. And so emotionally she was 
so happy and couldn't believe like how, I mean, it was such a life changing experience for her and her pain was, was managed so much better by um, taking those regular breaks. Yeah. By like alternating the activity and the rest, she's able to keep overall more activity going yeah. and stay more engaged. And I mean, I do think for people, this is a hard yeah. thing because like, I like to just sort of power through and be done with stuff. And I think that's kind of, for a lot of people, that's just kind of the standard. And so to start taking breaks like that is actually, we have to like develop a habit that's different from what we usually do, yeah. but that it can be so helpful, even with some conditions I've worked with too, where fatigue is a factor. It's the same thing. It's like, if you don't overdo it, you can keep the fatigue in check by sort of balancing activity and rest. Yeah. And then in the long run, you'll get a lot more activity in because you won't have those like crash periods where you can't get up for hours. Exactly. Exactly. And, I, I yeah. mean, the biggest thing here that like, I think is that emotional too, that and not, not just like the physical payback that you get, you know, you're not out exhausted or, um, in pain for the next three days because you managed it differently. But emotionally, people feel better. It's it's a really challenge. It's an easy skill to understand, but to put into practice, it is much more challenging. But it's important. Yes. So yeah. So those are those are the um, the main components. Again, we 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 want to go through that educational piece, the gate control theory, the cycle of disability, but then breathing retraining, relaxation. Um, automatic thoughts and cognitive restructuring and activity pacing. Those are the, I would see the main components when we're working with patients. Yeah, this is really important. Cool stuff. I think for listeners who want to hear more or who want to learn more, there are some great books out there and great resources on doing these types of um, behavioral approaches to chronic pain with some more, you know, more information and details and like, you know, um, structured therapies where you go through different sessions related to these topics. Mm -hmm. But I've really appreciated, Adrian, you um, sharing this expertise with us. I think this is a really important topic in our field. Yeah. And, um, something that is, you know, very prevalent in, in our, you know, in the world and part of the human experience. So I'm really grateful that you took the time to, to bring this material in and to, Share it with us. Absolutely, Debbie. And I thank you. This has been really fun for me. But I, I agree. This is chronic pain, I think, is, is kind of a hot topic right now, especially with the opioid crisis. It is. And, um, I think it's, yeah. it's going to be, I think it already has been more and more important, but it's going to continue to be more and more important. Yeah. Ahead. Yeah. I hope you'll come back and talk to us again, maybe about the opioid um, issue and other issues, because I think that this is really, you know, as we move away from opioids, because people are recognizing the problem with that, yeah. I think these um, behavioral approaches and just understanding these other factors are even more critical. Absolutely. So Absolutely. we... We, again, thank you and look forward to having you back. Thank you, Debbie. I, I would love to. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and iTunes. You can also find us at www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's offtheclockpsych.com. Music by John Goo and Susie Stevens.